Okay, on a Thursday edition for the podcast, we discuss if, in fact, Kyrie Irving and the Brooklyn Nets are at a point of impasse when it comes to the opportunity to have the superstar talent opt in, get an extension, or possibly walk away in free agency. A Christian Winfield article breaks down the possibly grim future ahead for the Brooklyn Nets and why Sean Marks and company could be facing a very interesting set of decisions in the very near future. It's all coming up right after the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, it is, of course, the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. We thank you for making us your first listen free on all those great platforms. And, of course, you know that I am Adam Armbrecht covering not only your Brooklyn Nets, but also the New York football giants over on the One Giant podcast with my boy Andy Mack. Sans Doug Nori today. We wish him nothing but safe travels in his journey. As we uh, take a look around the league a little bit here, maybe, as the playoffs are obviously in full swing. I know Doug made mention of that in yesterday's episode. Had a great conversation around Nicholas Claxton. Had that poll over on social media that that seems to say Nicholas Claxton is a player that should be brought back. And yet, the discussion we're going to have today does maybe have ramifications around all other decisions that the Brooklyn Nets may make this offseason. And it really all stems from a New York Daily News article from Christian Winfield, which essentially outlined information that he had going back to last offseason from people closely connected to the Nets organization, saying that there could be a series, series of dominoes that would fall, starting with James Harden not being on the Brooklyn Nets, check that box, and then ultimately Kyrie departing, followed by probably the most fearful of moments for Brooklyn Nets faithful, the departure of one Kevin Durant, despite being under contract, obviously, because in effect, things would have generally fallen apart. Um, The interesting thing that we want to get into here is is what it means, why did we get to this point, and ultimately, what are the options for either side, Kyrie Irving and for the Brooklyn Nets included, because the article does bring up some interesting points around where it stands from a cap ramification standpoint, something that Doug and I have spoke to before when we first discussed the idea of what they should do around Kyrie Irving and the extension this offseason. And then, of course, from Kyrie's standpoint, we know that there are uh, certain things that NBA players, any athlete does not want to do, such as play on a one-year contract when you don't know what could happen, especially from an injury standpoint. So inside of this article, it basically paints a picture that right now, the Brooklyn Nets and Kyrie Irving might be at a little bit of a standoff. One of the footnotes that they mentioned um, that uh, Winfield mentioned inside of the article is that uh, Kevin Durant and the Brooklyn Nets have not spoken since the first round exit at the hands of the Boston Celtics and the sweep of that series. I I push pack past that information because I don't think that that's necessarily anything to ground, uh, you know, groundbreaking here short of if there's these type of conversations around Kyrie Irving going on, is Kevin Durant involved? Had they already had these discussions going back? to prior seasons and would they of course we would all assume get his input before making any final decisions but essentially what it comes down to is then without relitigating all of the details over the last couple of seasons and really over Kyrie Irving's career let's just stay on the injury side of things he's had some minor always injuries that have kind of gone with him from season to season it's led him to miss time he missed time when he first came in with the Brooklyn Nets around the uh, the shoulder obviously he also had issues at the back end of what was the meant to be the Milwaukee Bucks series uh, leading up to that playoff run with the ankle and uh, Giannis, obviously that forced him out on the back end. Some of these things are fluky. Some of them are incidental. It's just part of basketball. It is what it is. Then you combine that with missing time around social issues going back to last season. He also missed as Winfield detailed in the article, a handful of weeks for an undisclosed reason that was behind the scenes, maybe discussed Uh, with the Brooklyn Nets, but certainly never revealed to the general public. And then you fast forward to, obviously, the mandate, vaccine, personal decisions, all of these things. As we said before, I don't want to dwell too heavily on this portion of it, um, but all of these things lead the Brooklyn Nets to a place now 
after having arguably, uh, you know, at the time when we talked about trading for James Harden and what it could have meant with those three players on the court together, I think Doug and I were proven right, if that matters, that the offensive sample size was so electric and so historically impressive that if it could have stayed together, we think that there would have been a really good chance for the Nets to have deep playoff runs and obviously a chance at championships. Now, retroactively, you look back and say, was there a mistake made there on the part of the Nets, on the part of Sean Marks, maybe pushing the panic button a little bit and going out and sacrificing key assets? Maybe the most important among them would be Jared Allen and what we've seen of his growth with the Cleveland Cavaliers to go get this player that now isn't here, assets back, Ben Simmons, curiosities and questions around him going forward as well. So there's certainly areas of, of, of that process that you can look at the organization and question whether or not they made the smartest moves. That being said, it all falls into this category of things that due to in part full, whatever involving Kyrie Irving had forced the nets to make certain decisions. Now they're at this new precipice of having to make a decision about signing him to an extension and aligning him with Kevin Durant's timeline. And previously when we had talked about it, uh, Doug and I, I mean, listen, Doug laid out a really sound logic around why you're kind of tied to Kyrie and it probably makes the most sense to retain him and to sign him to the extension. We know where the Nets stand from a cap standpoint. They are strapped and or over it. You know that you can continue to go over that cap and into luxury tax when you're retaining your players. But if you were to take this money off the books, it would not be that dollar for dollar replacement. So we know that they're they're locked in from that standpoint. And then the other and then the other part of it is what's the timeline? What do you gain if there was a departure here? Would you be able to next year make some adjustments to where you are? Depends on where the cap ends up probably. Maybe the year after that. And by that point you're talking about a 35-year-old Kevin Durant, he's two more years further down the road of his contract extension and where have all these other pieces fallen into place? So there's certainly a lot of questions that come with a decision like that. But if, as, as this article suggests, and General Sentiment May suggests, you are at a place now, and we heard Sean Marks say this at the end of the season press conference, that you want to reset the, the culture around the organization. You want players that want to be here and want to be a part of winning championships. I, a lot of this feels like the Nets, Joe Sy, everyone involved saying, we understand what what we went in for when we signed Kyrie and it got us Kevin Durant. And we understand what it meant when we went out and traded and made the big splash for James Harden, thinking what it could do for us. But we also acknowledge that it wasn't perfect. You know, so often we talk about whether it's with Kyrie, whether it's with players, whether it's with coaches, GMs, ownership. Doug and I always talk about on the podcast around it. The worst thing you can do is to make a mistake and then continue to throw good money after bad or bad money after good, whichever way that phrase goes, because what, what do you end up doing? Doubling down on the mistake that you made. And I do wonder if that's where the nets are right now. On the one hand, you could say, this is all just hard posturing. You want to find some level of commitment from Kyrie, but I don't know how you get that right. Short of saying, Hey, play on the player option and then we'll extend you. Maybe it's a shorter term deal, a, you know, one in one deal, a two year contract, um, there is no opportunity to play for the incentives uh, tied to the contract around, um, you know, number of games played because that's not something that's been collectively bargained yet, though it could be on the docket and maybe it could look different a year or two from now uh, if those adjustments come to pass. But as it stands in this moment, you're asking for assurances that, and this is not even on Kyrie from that standpoint of saying, convince me that you're going to be committed. I'm committed. What else is there to be done or said on Kyrie Irving's part other than to say, it's been a rough couple of years. I understand the, the choices that I made. I stand by my personal decisions. I understand why it might frustrate you, but I also do want to be here and be a part of this. It's taking someone at their word when you're not sure that you can take them at their word. Now, the other factors here are, um, what does Kyrie Irving see out on the landscape as far as what could be achieved out on the open market? And understanding there's a couple of mechanics there that when we think about leverage, who, who has the strength here, it probably it, it falls in the hands of Kyrie Irving in a lot of ways for not just the reasons we talk about with the window that the Nets have to win a championship and what the landscape would look like without Kyrie Irving in the short term and trying to rebuild around Kevin Durant. We 
think, let's have our fingers crossed and say a healthy Ben Simmons and how that plays itself out in the Eastern Conference. We'll get into that aspect of it. Some of the mechanics describe where the cap room would be situated uh, if Kyrie were to opt out of the upcoming season and walk into free agency. And then what would the prospects be for the Brooklyn Nets going forward without him? There's a risk reward here. And I think the Nets are at this place where they have to take the hard look in the mirror, ask the question if it is worth it. And worth it means championships to retain Kyrie Irving here alongside of Kevin Durant. And if not, you open up the door for what was stated at the top of Christian Winfield's article, the departure of James Harden, followed by Kyrie Irving, and maybe ultimately Kevin Durant, and effectively getting yourself back into a rebuilding mode, something Sean Marks has done before you ever got to see the ultimate success of this superstar team you tried to put together. Before we do that, though, got to tell you about our friends over at Rock Auto. That's because if you're looking for all the right parts at great prices for your car or truck, you have to be over on rockauto.com. I told you last week uh, that I tried to use the wiper fluid on my Honda and squirt, squirt, nothing came out. With the pollen falling, covering the windshield, I needed to get myself some wiper fluid and, more importantly, the hose that runs from the fluid tank to my wipers. I was able to go over to rockauto.com, pull up my Honda Insight, get the year, the make, the model, and know that I was by 30, 50, or even 100% more than going into an auto parts store, asking for the right part, hoping it's correct, paying a premium, and maybe finding yourself taking a trip right back over there. As you know, Rock Auto is a family business serving the do-it-yourselfers like you, like me, for over 20 years, and the prices are always reliably low for every single customer. You can go over to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your truck. Get lot on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. It's amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. So inside of this conversation then, the next phase of this question becomes, if we're going to walk down this road, uh, why Kyrie Irving has the control in this situation? So as it stands right now, we know that the Brooklyn Nets can create the space and pay Kyrie Irving his max 35% of the salary cap on a four-year near $185 million if they want to keep them together for Ben to come back hopefully healthy, have this collection of elite talent that, again, on paper, if Ben Simmons can do what he is, who I think has been an undervalued or devalued asset in a lot of eyes around the NBA, you're right back in there. The supporting cast, you know, Doug just outlined paying Nicholas Claxton, keeping him here on a three year deal. Is he worth the 35 million? Almost certainly yes. Then you look at some of those other veteran players, the Goran Dragic's of the world, Blake Griffin. You know, are you going to try to keep some of these pieces around to say nothing of the decision that you'll have to make on Bruce Brown, who's an unrestricted free agent? And maybe you're begging the question of paying him upwards of 45 to 50 million dollars on a three year deal as well. That's kind of the keep the band together and see if you can make this thing work and get yourself a championship. But the other side of it is, what if Kyrie Irving outright walks away? If you come to this point where you're at an impasse, Kyrie Irving is not going to play underneath the player option, and the Brooklyn Nets are not going to give him a long deal. The interesting thing that happens here now is the there's only a handful of teams, first and foremost, that would be able to bring in Kyrie Irving in the offseason, and then there's a mechanic around it that actually makes it possible for Kyrie Irving, if not wanting to go to one of the limited destination options he would have this offseason, still find his way to the team of his choice. That's because, as again outlined in the article by Winfield uh, over on New York Daily News, you can have a summertime trade free agent acquisition. Uh, no September, the uh, summer acquisition can be traded by the acquiring team. So if Kyrie Irving who can only go to teams such as the Spurs, Pacers, Pistons, Magic, or Trailblazers, could also then be rerouted in mid-December to the team of his choosing with one of those five total teams serving to benefit from assets, draft compensation, players, etc. So the big problem here is, at least from a Brooklyn Nets standpoint, and this is kind of what we talked about around the James Harden piece, 
Well, if you don't trade him as they chose to do, it would have been the same piece. He had a player option to buy into. He wants to opt out. He wants to get his maximum dollars. Even if he had come back on the player option, I think now we would look at with the sample size we got since his departure to Philadelphia say that would have been a disaster. And that's why you pulled the trigger to get some assets now. A little bit of draft capital. Obviously, a player like Seth Curry, we feel like he's valuable in the short term at the very least. And then also you throw in a Ben Simmons, healthy. We look to move forward with him. The Nets aren't afforded that option here. If Kyrie opts out, he just walks into free agency. The Nets don't have to put in that money underneath the cap, but they find themselves then sitting. Were Kyrie Irving not to opt in to what ends up being the 36.9, nearly $37 million, they're still going to go into this season with north of $44 million for Kevin Durant, Ben Simmons at 35 and change, the 18.6 on a Joe Harris, along with Seth Curry at 8.4. Down the line, Patty Mills, the player option from north of six. Cam and Dayron are accounted for. Their cap holds being accounted for here as well would be Bruce Brown, Nicholas Claxton, and then any of these other players that they could bring back, even on veteran minimums, like Goran Dragic, Blake Griffin, uh, LaMarcus Aldridge as well, even Andre Drummond thrown into that mix. So there's all those other decisions to make. But even when you remove Kyrie Irving's money, you're still sitting up at 120 just off of Kevin Durant, Ben Simmons, Joe Harris, and then essentially Curry and Patty Mills. That's going to get you rated the cap number. So you don't have the flexibility to then turn around in free agency and say, and who wants to come? Now it starts to open up different mechanics from the Brooklyn Nets standpoint about what they could do after this. If it doesn't go the way that they hope, then I think there's some decisions that they could try to make in and around players that, especially Nicholas Claxton, that Doug just spoke about. This is why it's it's a weird set of circumstances because Kyrie has the leverage, I would say. The Brooklyn Nets are a little bit held over on this one because they still have Kevin Durant and they obviously don't want to risk losing him. And I think the bigger question becomes, what would Kevin Durant Let's uh, assuming the health of Ben Simmons, look at this roster and think it's possible of in the short term. And then over the next couple of seasons, that's where I think you, you start to work the mechanics. So we said coming off of Doug uh, speaking about Claxton yesterday, yes, you should resign him. Now, if you resign him and you have Claxton and you have Ben Simmons, let's just assume you bring back Bruce Brown as well. Bruce Brown has some shooting touch specifically from the one corner beyond the arc this past season. Not so great from everywhere else from deep. However, so you still have this weird combination, a couple of shooters coming off of injuries and Joe Harris and in Seth Curry. It's a weird bag. And if you take away the electric offensive talent that is Kyrie Irving, would you all of a sudden look at Nicholas Claxton and say, do we have an opportunity maybe to take that three-year deal and do a sign and trade and move him somewhere else to bring back in a more high-profile, high-talented offensive weapon that complements Kevin Durant? and then worry about figuring out the details kind of in the background. That's a bit of the all-in mentality, right? Because you'd then be saying, probably leaning more veteran-heavy, more experienced players, taking on some bigger money potentially, and trying to make it work over the next couple of seasons, including maybe along the way, having to sacrifice a, a Cam Thomas to make some things work. Not even mentioned in there is the new contract money that'll come in once Kessler Edwards gets sorted out as well. That... This is where Kyrie Irving has even more leverage as well because you're not taking off. Let's say Ben Simmons had been here for a handful of years and he's a great defensive talent and he didn't want to be a part of this after a couple of seasons and he had the player option was looking to potentially walk away. Well, I can replace that. I can say is Nicholas Claxton the one for one Ben Simmons in terms of what he can do? No, but he's cheaper and I can use Nicholas Claxton plus a Bruce Brown and manufacture some of the defensive value and then allow my offensive talent to carry on that end of the floor. This, however, is taking away the second best offensive weapon on this roster. And you're even further, you're even further limited from that standpoint because you no longer have James Harden, whatever he was in his version. So you're, you're thin, maybe getting extra, extra thinner, even that much more thin at, at, at offensive firepower were Kyrie to depart, let alone that it probably also diminishes Seth Curry's value and Joe Harris's value. Now you start to think about, do you try to move the Joe Harris money? Do you try to get flexible there? And will Kevin Durant survive or be willing to ride out a, an effective rebuild around him? Even if you accomplish it over a season, it's still going to be one year in you know the, the back end of his prime that you could potentially be wasting away. 
that's where I think it hurts to say nothing of, and we're probably not going to speak to it. The relationship between Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, whether or not that's as strong as it's ever been, or as Doug and I always talk about, listen, we're on the court together. That's where we're friends. What we do away from the court may not matter as much. All of those things could certainly be factors in this, but if Kevin Durant wants to win championships, it's hard to sit there as a star on the Brooklyn Nets and watch one of the top, wherever you want to put them, 25 talent, 30 talent in the league, walk out the door and potentially go play somewhere else. And from a net standpoint, organizationally, watch someone else re reap the benefits potentially of the capital in return. Should you see one of those summertime acquisition trades later in December? The other piece would be, what is the outlook though for this team coming up in a second? And I know this is all speculative, but let's walk the mechanics of it because for whatever we think is never going to happen or would never happen, there's a world where it does happen where this is the direction it goes and Kyrie Irving is coming up on that decision about the opt-in and what he'll choose to do. And if the Brooklyn Nets and Sean Marks are at the place of not blinking, then we could be staring down the barrel of, okay, if Kyrie Irving is gone, if he's not going to be a part of this, then what can the Nets do around Kevin Durant? What would the expectations be? We'll tap into that here in a second. Right after we, of course, tell you about our friends over at Truebill. That's because you know it, friends. You've got subscriptions to those fancy TV apps. Maybe you have automated payment systems in place, and then you forget about them. I know I do. I have 9,000 apps probably. I don't know, 10,000, 200, one. It doesn't matter. The point is you often find yourself paying for subscriptions that you simply forgot about. And that's where Truebill comes in because it's the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for those subscriptions that you don't need, you don't want, or Sky simply forgot about on average people save $720 a year with Truebill and that's because companies want to make subscriptions hard to cancel Truebill steps in and makes it incredibly easy just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap and your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so that you don't have to and even negotiate better deals for the ones that you want to keep I'm talking about saving big dollars when it turned out that I was paying for multiple subscriptions of a popular known streaming service that goes something like boom before you watch a show. Yeah, I was paying for it twice. Truebill made it nice, got rid of the one that I did not need. Truebill has had over 2 million users and helped them save over $100 million. Don't fall for subscription scams anymore. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. Okay. The other little tidbit that was thrown out here in this uh, article as well, and just it's a, good, it's a good talking point, and I think, listen, this is not the, the ideal scenario here, and that was what would the expectations be for the Brooklyn Nets if Kyrie Irving were to walk away? First round exit? Now, the Nets finished this past season in the seventh seed. We know they had to battle their way ultimately to get there. Um, and a lot of this thing, a lot of this would be asking questions of, is Ben Simmons 100% healthy? Uh, what's the state of his game when he comes in there? What other players have you been able to attract on the trade exemptions potentially? That's a little mechanic that the Nets can utilize here going forward around Kevin Durant. I don't know. I think the the bigger question inside of an inside of an Eastern Conference was obviously far more competitive. And the funny thing is, when you look at it right now, talk about the teams in behind the Brooklyn Nets, just at that seventh seed. Okay, it's the Atlanta Hawks. They had a down year. Clearly something is off for them, though. I mean, they had a bit of a, a rise to power, but they're further away than closer. I think they're going to have a little bit of a shakeup for themselves. They want to get over that hump, but the Bulls are growing and getting better. We know Zach Levine is going to go to free agency. It doesn't mean he's not going to end up back with Chicago. And the Cavaliers, with the aforementioned Jared Allen and this young squad, right, and Mobley and everything that they're doing, they're going to be a competitive team. They're going to be better then 44 and 38 next year, or at least right at that same precipice. And then you talk about the Hornets, the Knicks had a bad year. Okay, fine. But 10th and above, if we want to include the Hornets in that mix, probably not justifiably. So are all going to be competitive 40 plus win teams going into next season. And then if they do anything right, could the 76ers come down to earth a little bit from a record standpoint, maybe Bucks, Celtics though, they're going to be right back at the top, I think. And then the heat are certainly going to be in that mix. The point being is there might not be as much movement available for the Brooklyn Nets, even if they're a hundred percent healthy and you keep Kyrie Irving, they still could find themselves being the fourth seed 51 wins being the benchmark there with Kyrie, Kevin Durant and Ben Simmons and the supporting cast. Yeah. 
okay, you know, you can put me right into that, into that wheelhouse there. So anywhere from eight to four is probably that range. If you talk about with, without Kyrie Irving. Is it automatically a first round exit? I like to think, and we saw this in the playoffs while it ended, you know, seemingly down three, one at the time of this recording uh, for the Dallas Mavericks. Listen, Luca effectively did it. Got a little bit of Spencer Dinwiddie there, a little bit of Brunson going on. Sure. There's been some players around him, but he's one superstar talent on a team of decent, albeit average supporting cast that took his team all the way to the Western conference finals. And even if they lose four games to one or wherever that one shakes out, you still got there only on the shoulders of that player, essentially. That's, you know, putting in a little bit broad stroke. But can Kevin Durant be capable of that? Understanding that you're going to have a version of Ben Simmons? I would have a hard time looking at the Eastern landscape and say you're going to get through Milwaukee and Philadelphia. Even the Raptors would be a tough team with the way they're constructing the length that they have. It would be a challenge, but they can get out of the first round, I would say, depending on where their seating shakes out. But the difference is to me, it's not about what would happen if you didn't have Kyrie Irving. It's where is the ceiling with Kyrie Irving? That's what I think the bigger question is here. The Brooklyn, and maybe why the Brooklyn Nets think that they do have leverage in this scenario internally, in their heart of hearts, because they may look at it and say, in their quiet, honest moments, are we going to, with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, enter into next year with some level of uncertainty around Kyrie, And with uncertainty around the health and condition of Ben Simmons game coming into next season, going to thrust ourselves right back into Eastern Conference finals contention and finals appearances. By the way, they've only made it to the second round in any iteration of this team for everything that's gone on. They've only made it to the second round of the playoffs so far. So now you're going to tell me that they can thrust themselves into that conversation that they could have to maybe if they had walked in the way they did this year take on the Boston Celtics, who are obviously a strong team going forward here, beat them, then come out of that as a six or seven seed, maybe have to take on the Milwaukee Bucks and beat them and then face a challenge of some iteration of Miami or Philadelphia or wherever the Raptors could fall in or whatever the Bulls may do. I just don't know that this team, even as constituted with Kyrie Irving, is going to be one that can win you that championship over this window. Now, Obviously, you're better with Kyrie Irving, but how much sooner can you reconstruct if he were to walk out the door right now? Going by next year, the money can look a lot different. You can make decisions around Joe Harris. You can restructure some of the contracts, and you can find yourself capable of going out and getting a couple of key players. Not still able to go out and get max money on somebody, but you could make moves that fill this roster out. It's a conundrum, man. I I really, it's hard. Like on paper, it's the same reason why on paper you make the trade for for James Harden. Because what does it do? Elevates your opportunity to win a championship. And then when it doesn't work, you look back and you think about everything you gave up and whether or not it was truly worth it. And that's hindsight. And you really can't afford to do that. But if the Brooklyn Nets sign Kyrie Irving to an extension and two and a half seasons from now, he maybe has missed 30 games a year for injury or otherwise, or more, or he's been there and the team just hasn't been able to win. And they've been exited out in the second round or maybe gotten to the conference finals and lost once, but never got to the finals. I don't know. I don't know what, what the right answer is here. And I think that the Brooklyn nets are staring themselves in the mirror, as I said at the top and wondering what right and wrong decisions have we made to this point? And what are the right decisions to make going forward? It's fascinating. I'm sure there'll be more conversations around this throughout the rest of the offseason until Kyrie makes his decision around opting in, until you hear that the Brooklyn Nets are signing him to an extension. Again, if Doug were here, he'd say, they're going to sign him. They're going to extend him. It's the thing that makes sense. Kevin Durant's going to want him here. And what do you cost or potentially put yourself into a difficult spot with your only remaining superstar were Kyrie to leave? I get it. But if one thing we know for sure, the Brooklyn Nets have not been predictable since they signed Kyrie Irving. It has been not a circus, I would say, around, you know, because not everything has been upheaval and chaos, but it's been this slow boil, this slow boil of questions and curiosities. Kenny Atkinson and Ime Doku and hiring of Steve Nash. 
and get, signing DeAndre Jordan for Kevin Durant and having to move that money and finding quality players in Bruce Brown, managing to get something back for a disgruntled James Harden after sending out so many assets and sacrificing one of your young, drafted, developing talents. It's just been one of those type of runs. And it's a tumultuous way to have your franchise go for and that's where I think the examination for the Brooklyn Nets is happening, and maybe ultimately for Kyrie Irving. We'll see how it all plays out. As you know, you can get us over on YouTube. You can follow, subscribe, love, like the podcast, all of those great things. When Doug's not here, I don't do a quote. I simply say that I miss my co-host, and I can't wait to get him back on here with me. And of course, until next time, we will be back, hoping for the best, hoping for positive updates, and talking all things Brooklyn Nets basketball.